Hi, everybody. Welcome to this housing partnership meeting of October 3rd. Um, we, have, we have a full agenda. We have Mayor Shara, who's going to be joining us. And I think Carolyn Mish is also on this call currently. Um, I don't see anybody from the public here, right? I just really just us and our guests. Um, Keith, you had you had said to me before that Carolyn wouldn't be able to be here and, and she is here now. The mayor isn't here. Should we should we start with her since her time is limited? Hello. I think that's a good idea. Okay. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, how are you? Good, good to be so, here. Welcome to the partnership. Um, oh, we're, obviously, thanks. we have you and the mayor coming. Um, the mayor isn't quite here yet. I heard your time might be limited, so I wondered if we could do introductions and I'll say a few introductory things and we could start with you. Sure. That would be that would be great. I do just to clarify, um, given uh, there were some scheduling changes, mm -hmm. I also need to be at legislative matters um, later. So this sort of all came up after Keith and I had talked about coming here. So um, I definitely if we don't get a chance to continue our conversations, I'd love to be able to um, um, do that at another meeting if you all want that. So um, okay. Shall we? So let's quickly go around. I'm Carmen Juno. I'm I'm the chair of the housing partnership. I've been on the partnership for about three and a half years. Um, Jen. Hi, Carolyn. I'm Jen Derringer. I'm back on the housing partnership after a long hiatus when I was on the planning board and serving as the partnership uh, person. Ace. Good to see you. Uh, hi, I'm Ace Taylor. They them. I'm a homeowner and landlord in Northampton. I've been on the housing partnership for about two years now. Great, thanks. Nice to meet you. Gordon? Hi, Carolyn, it's Gordon. Hi. I'm I've been on the partnership for probably at least 10 years, probably longer, I don't remember exactly when. I'm the vice chair yeah. um, and uh, I, I work with Jennifer at Community Legal Aid. Great, Hannah. good to see you. Hi, I'm Hannah Schaefer. I've been on the partnership for about two years now, and I am a renter in Florence. Edgardo. Nice to meet you. Hi, Carolyn. I'm Edgar Cancel. You might recall the name from Valley Bike. Um, and uh, I'm no longer at Valley Bike, but um, uh, I have been on the partnership for about four years. Um, and uh, I'm a renter in Florence. And I'm also on the um, board of the Housing Authority. Nice to see you again. I'm Bev. Hi, uh, my name is Bev Bates. It's Beverly, so we don't get it wrong, but only my dad calls me that. Um, I am uh, probably one of the newest members. I joined the partnership in the summer, I think July-ish. Um, <clears throat> I'm a recent resident of Northampton, although I spent a good part of my younger life uh, here and elsewhere in Western Mass. And I recently retired uh, uh, from the community builders, which you may or may not know is an affordable sure. housing developer working here sure. and elsewhere. Great, Thanks, thank you. I'm um, Sarah. Hey, I'm Sarah Howard. Um, I've been on the partnership for about two years and I'm a nurse. I work, uh, one of the things I do is work with um, in mental health and you know, there's a lot of houselessness going on. And um, I also went through nursing school by living in um, subsidized housing in Amherst. So <laughs> I have that perspective as well. Great. Nice to meet you, Gwen. Um, yes, hello, my name is Gwen Nabad and I'm one of the newer members as well. And I currently live in public housing in Northampton and I'm going to school at Hampshire. And um, 
I just have a lot of lived experience as a renter. And I did go to nursing school. So. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks. Hi, Mayor Shara. We just went around and introduced everybody. So I might, um, I'm not sure what would be best here. Um, uh, and, and we have both you and Carolyn Mish. Um, maybe I'll just continue at this point. I just wanted to say a few sentences summarizing what we have been, um, what we have been planning uh, or what we have been talking about in working on in the housing partnership. But let me first turn to you, Carolyn, ask you to introduce yourself and to you, Mayor Shara, just ask you to say a few words. Mayor, go for it. <laughs> Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Gina Louise Shara. I'm the mayor. Um, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, I'm uh, so happy to have this conversation with you all. So um, I was on the city council for eight years before I became mayor. I was a ward four counselor and then I was an at-large counselor and I was a council president for my last term. Um, and I would say that affordable housing has um, was my one of my primary interests and things that I cared about most and fought for most as a counselor, and that certainly has carried on um, as mayor. And um, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing as a city, and um, I'm always happy to find ways to do more and better. Um, so I'm just really glad to be here with all of you, and I thank you all very much for, um, for the work that you do to support housing in the city. So thank you. Carolyn, do you want to say a few words? Sure. Um, it's um, I'm happy to be here as well in sort of my new role as um, the planning director for the Office of Planning and Sustainability. I know I've worked um, with um, some of you in different capacities and, and it, for different amounts of time um, in the past. And I look forward to having um, you know, working with Keith and the rest of you um, sort of more as it really relates to housing projects that we're doing in the planning office. And and um, I too, as you may or may not know, but have been working for many years um, in my role um, as a senior planner and permits manager, as well as assistant director for the planning office um, over the last um, 22 years on regulatory um, and planning implementation to try to address our housing needs in the city. And so I as well feel that it's a critical piece of our, um, the housing, um, you know, um, issues uh, that we're currently facing and what have been facing for several years is really critical to um, our community and how we um, grow um, and change over time and, and accommodate um, everyone who wants to be here, who lives here currently. Um, and so I um, will continue in my capacity as a planning director to look for strategies to sort of unravel and try to address some of those um, cost issues and barriers to um, housing. And, and I look forward to doing that um, in partnership with you all. So I just wanted to say, thank you very much. I just wanted to say a few very, give a very broad outline of a few of the things we've been working on, um, just so you know where we're at. Um, in the past year, um, I'm sure you're familiar with these issues we've initiated and it was approved by city council and Mayor Shara, I believe, um, the home rule petition to transfer brokers fees to, um, uh, to get them off the backs of renters. And I believe that's in the state legislature. So that was a big project. Um, we've been, um, ACE in particular with the help of some city councilors has been researching um, transfer fees um, and the, uh, the creative ways that some other communities are, um, are uh, creating new um, ordinances or whatever you call it to get another revenue stream from transfer fees of homes above the median or X percentage above the median. 
And we've been talking a lot and researching um, municipal housing trust funds. And we know that Northampton has a dormant municipal housing trust fund. We know that if we had other creative income streams, such as the transfer fee um, of homes sold over the median, that that would need to go somewhere. And the logical place would be the municipal housing trust fund. Um, and um, we wonder what you think about that. And we also have, have been talking about the following question. Is it a lack of money or is it a lack of capacity that stalls affordable housing development sometimes? So with that, I'll turn it over to maybe start with you, Mayor Shara. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in learning more about the affordable housing trust fund. This is actually something that I, when I was a counselor, this is many years back, I sort of explored a little bit. Um, I think Carolyn remembers sitting down and talking to me about it. Um, and um, I would like to understand more about the transfer fee component of it because um, my understanding is, that, so transfer fees now go into the CPC, is that correct? Ace. So as of this moment in time, as far as I'm aware, Northampton doesn't have a transfer fee placed on real estate transactions. Um, based on a couple of bills that are currently sitting in state legislature, um, it's they're trying to make it possible for municipalities to pass these kinds of laws without having to go through a home rule petition. If any of these bills pass as each of them are currently written, it would be required for any money generated by a transfer fee to go into a housing trust if one exists. This is making an assumption that one of these bills will pass, but it would match with existing bills that have passed in other municipalities where their transfer fees are going to housing trusts first. If that were the case, we'd have to apply for a home rule petition to have it go anywhere else. Thank you, Ace. Okay. So, yeah, I think the maybe there's um, there there's state the state funding for CPC um, comes from some of that that real estate um, transfer. I think I believe now. So that may be some of the confusion. We don't locally um, fund CPC that way. Um, so that would that's that's the um, and so the way that I think the language is written now for the transfer real estate transfer fee is as mm -hmm. Ace mentioned that it would go through um, that would be the mechanism to get capture some of those um, resources and if you have a, um, an affordable housing trust on the books um, then that would be the recipient if you don't then it goes to CPC. Okay thank you. Thank, thanks for giving me that education, everybody. And Carmen, I realized we didn't really answer your you, you, your question was, is it capacity or is it funds? Um, and Carolyn is probably better a better person to answer that. But I would say just from what I've observed is that there's there uh, have been no projects that have come to the city that we haven't funded in some way. So, um, and I do know that one thing that we're doing sort of particularly well is finding um, finding lots for say Habitat for Humanity and creating um, opportunities for for those units that at, at a faster rate than they're able to build them. So um, I feel like we are kind of meeting and anything that's coming towards us and any projects that are are being proposed, we are trying very hard to meet them and um, provide them with whatever funding we can. And there's not, as far as I know, there isn't something that we have not had um, the economic capacity to help make happen. Um, so I would just like to see more projects come our way. And 
Yeah, maybe to build on that as well. I think um, in some cases, I think there is, there's a capacity issue in terms of, right, the affordable housing providers. Um, and as the mayor said, you know, we're giving them as much money as they're asking for. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I guess from uh, my perspective, I think we're building a lot of affordable housing in, um, in Northampton, um, but we're not building as much of that lower market rate housing um, and supporting that kind of housing. And so I think we're, you know, we're, we're coming up with parcels, we're coming up with land, we're coming up with all opportunities for the small um, um, nonprofit housing, affordable housing developers like Habitat, as the mayor said, and, um, and as well as Wayfinders and Valley CDC. And so they're, they're, um, they're, are meeting, they're meeting those um, projects that we are partnering with them on, but it's really the next level of housing that I think is that we're, that we're missing. And so um, adding or trying to find new sources of funding won't necessarily get us to those housing kinds of projects. Um, and we'd still, um, I think there's a, there's a capacity from the housing providers perspective that we're, we may be uh, up against. Um, the other capacity issue is supporting, um, is an is a issue about supporting a new fund and a new um, committee or a board as well, that that's part of the equation, I think that um, yeah. would need to be considered. So thank you, Bev, I saw, I saw you had your hand up. It, yes. I probably should use the digital hand, but um, no, use your regular hand. hand. I'm having trouble with the full screen. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm still learning, so I just wanted to make sure I understand the distinction between the uh, CPC funding and the um, transfer tax that we've been talking about. It's my understanding CPC is a um, surcharge on real estate uh, property taxes, right? And a transfer tax is, as the name suggests, uh, a tax on sales, uh, transfers of property. Um, and that's as much not to deliver a uh, speech on the topic as to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Yeah. So I think, you know, as ACE has thought about it and as we've thought about it, uh, those would be net new dollars. Now, they would still be coming out of somebody's pocket and that somebody might be unhappy about it um, or not. But um we spent some time talking about just what you're saying is 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 the problem that we're solving for or one of them uh, funding or is it something else? And I think I'm hearing from you guys that uh, at this point in time, uh, supply meets demand. But I'm curious as to what you guys think are the sort of larger barriers to meeting whatever the strategic housing goals are for the city. And, and quite frankly, I don't quite know what those are either. So maybe if you could speak to that as well. Hmm. Um, I mean, is there a number we'd like a hundred units a year or something else floating around out there? Um, I don't, I mean, we, don't necessarily have a strategic plan of how many affordable housing units right. um, that you know subsidize um, restricted affordable housing units that we need uh, or would like to be able to continue to develop. Um, I think what we've been trying to do is meet the needs of the providers, so TCB and Valley CDC and um, Habitat for sure. Habitat is, you know, that's a different model, obviously, it's just single family homes, but, um, you know, we are meeting that. I think um, the, uh, you know, if we look at the total numbers of all housing units, we're way down, and you may know this from your work at TCB, that, you um, the total number of housing units needed in Massachusetts is, is you know, well over 100,000 and, you know, drilled down to Hampshire County based on the Donahue Institute report is around 3,500 by 2025. 
you know, Northampton's not going to absorb all of those 3,500 units and certainly not in a year and a half. Um, but that's well beyond what we're going to be building. So the gap is going to continue to, you know, increase. Um, and I think at this point, I mean, so we also, um, I think even if we set goals for how many housing units that we would want, the city can't build those units, right? So, um, in some sense, it might not be our place to set, um, you know, a goal for X number of affordable housing units, um, except maybe just we could set a goal to fund, you know, 100% of all the requests, which I think we already do. Um, yeah. Um, I want to clarify, when you say the city can't fulfill all of those requests, uh, I, why? <laughs> we can't build. Um, I think we can't we, build. The city's not building those housing. The city either. doesn't create housing. We help facilitate it. Right. Um, are there, do you have means in place to incentivize that housing to get built? And are there other things like that on the table to encourage that housing to get built? If the city can't do it, then by private developers. Sure. I mean, we, that's what we've been working on for the last um, 10 years in a really concerted effort is modify. I mean, we have the regulatory mechanism to modify um, sort of the the rules for development in neighborhoods and strategically we've we've looked at where does it make sense to have housing units and where do we have the capacity to have the housing units and so that's what our zoning amendments have been all about over the course of the last 10 years is try to create incentives for new types of housing reduce the um, restrictions on the total number of housing units and and the approvals process um, and that's where having um, the housing partnership participate in those conversations when they go to the to the city council for um, approval uh, is very helpful um, as you know an advocacy group for sort of releasing and allowing more of that housing to um, be um, developed we also have a problem though we we can we can adopt regulations that um, make it easier, facilitate different types of housing units, smaller units to meet the different demands. Um, however, when those projects do come forward to the planning board, there's often neighborhood resistance to those projects. And um, so it's really would be beneficial to have advocates at the table during that process, not just the regular, the legislative process when those rules are adopted, but when there's actually um, permitting that's happening that um, where uh, housing developers are taking advantage or trying to meet the city's um, interest and goals and um, provide the housing that we're trying to create for which we're trying to create incentives um, that often meets up against resistance. Okay, thank you. So Richard, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm puzzled about something. I think you've, uh, everyone has correctly identified and it's been a longstanding problem that one of the hardest niches to uh, create housing opportunities for are those people who are in the um, more economically challenged part of the spectrum. And I have always assumed that one of the stumbling blocks to that is that the financing packages just don't provide enough funds to provide a deep enough subsidy to qualify those people. So it would seem to me a logical sequelae that if we have another income source and we've identified this is the most difficult area to address, that we could then either you know make known or have a RFP or encourage our providers to come to us 
with proposals that are more deeply funded to target that more difficult area of our population to house. Um, I have a couple of questions about sort of what your um, um, about that about your statements is. Are you saying that, um, and maybe it's just that I I wasn't clear about where the issues are. But I think the um, the funding that, that we're providing through CPC um, to Valley and TCB isn't um, lacking. I mean, they're able to leverage that against state and federal funding to achieve the um, number of units or the project that they want to, to build. So I don't know that more funding from the city will um, allow them to create more units. Um, but maybe I'm misunderstanding your um, well, I, you know, over the years, um, when we've had presentations from people with various proposals, they talk about how hard it is to qualify some of the people that are more economically challenged. And, you know, the way to do that is to lower the threshold, you know, whether that's some sort of subsidy ongoing for the, the payments or initial subsidies to get in. You know, I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to sit here and say, you know, for this project, if we had this, then we could do that. But the general theme has been, yes, there's funding, but the funding only takes you to certain uh, segments of the income level population. And it doesn't always provide a deep enough funding or a funding reserve to address what we have identified as the area that we'd like to uh, find ways to address. So are you talking about the very lowest income, so 30% and below of area median income um, population? That's been one of the ones that's been harder, but sometimes it's even shouldered above that that's sometimes challenging, but yes. And, and it may be other kinds of housing that we don't even know, you know, nobody at a long time ago realized that the small housing, you know, boom would be there. And we don't know what, you know, provider modality, modalities would exist if if the funding were there. I, I, I have an intuitive sense that if there's a funding reserve that's targeted for what we identify as the most pressing need that it will if there is money they will come that's and so i'm um, i how richard how would it be different than the available funding stream that's cpc that's for affordable housing that is certainly a piece of the puzzle and i don't you know, my historical sense of this, and I could be wrong, is that yes, CPC is generous in Northampton. Certainly, you know, historically, I'm not sitting here saying, you know, we don't do our part. We certainly, you know, have been, uh, you know, a shining example of a community that's committed to um, creating housing. But I do, you know, have a sense that providers who go to the CPC feel like they're constrained in what they can ask for, how often they can ask for it, what level of funding. And so, you know, I, I'm conceptually saying that a transfer tax in its, um, you know, very essence is designed to say, you know, people are making significant money when they sell their real estate. We want to channel that to the people who are more challenged in the housing front. So, I, you know, it just seems um, like um, a highly desirable thing to add to our toolbox. 
I think that, I mean, I guess I would say that I'm not sure that would necessarily add to, we certainly haven't felt like we've told um, how affordable housing developers that they're coming to the well too often. <laughs> um, they certainly, I mean, you see Valley CDC almost every year asking, um, and certainly we, we provide parcels for habitat and then habitat sometimes come. So um, I think the other piece of it is the CPC is required to look at what other funding sources are out there. So it might effectively come to um, dilute the total amount of funding if you know CBC sees that there's this other pot of money that's also being used so maybe the CBC would be drawn down to reserve for other projects um, and then the other thing that I don't think has been hashed out I think conceptually it sounds good but there's a, I have a concern about the um, the transfer tax actually affecting lower and middle um income buyers who will then um as housing prices get more um start continue to rise that they will be affected by um the transfer fee because it will be passed on to them to know um that they aren't you know the the wealthiest buyers but they will get hit by those so i think it depends um so i think we we just need to be careful about um you know, where that um, is going and how much we're actually able to collect to in, to enhance the pot as opposed to just diluting it. Ace? I can certainly answer the second question regarding the transfer fee tax in that it is inherently designed to be based on median income currently of single family homes. Um, you're correct that this doesn't address concerns about uh, multifamily homes being unfairly priced. That said, built into basically all the existing laws already are reassessment periods and uh, minimums that can be affected. So you can't tax anything below the median uh, sales price. So at least in that regard, um, this proposed tax isn't going to affect anyone below anyone buying or selling below the median single family house which is in Northampton currently around $370,000 so i that but isn't it isn't it the um, median based on the statewide median and not the regional or, or local median, which I think um, brings uh, it down yeah. a little bit lower than the than what it would be in Northampton, which is not really by much. It's a matter of maybe $10,000. It's it's not a it's not a lot less. Boston, uh, Boston swings the median up by a lot. Yeah. So I just would just like to backtrack for one moment and say that I think in some ways, Richard, your comments reflect that we are as a group a little bit surprised to hear that it's not a lack of money that is hindering further development of affordable housing. In fact, you're saying that everything that has been requested is funded. So I would just like to move the conversation along a little bit and ask both of you, Carolyn and Mayor Shara, what, what in your opinion um, um, would be helpful for us to focus on and what are your priorities for this coming year? Um, well, so, you know, one supporting the projects that are sort of in the pipeline right now, I would say, um, and, um, continuing all of your help and as Carolyn said with um, sort of the legislative side and supporting those projects but also I fully agree with Carolyn about um, how some of these smaller projects um, get scuttled because of um, you know neighborhood um, sort of community uh, feelings about them and that's so when I first started as a city councilor this is, is in 2014, um, I worked on seven plus unit 
um, zoning in URB and URC. And my hope with that was that we would create more of these sort of smaller units. And, um, and then I've seen quite a few projects where uh, developers have brought forward proposals and their the neighborhoods doesn't want to see that kind of change and they don't happen. Um, so any sort of support around us achieving our goals around creating more units would be really helpful. Um, the city is looking at doing, so I think one of the most creative uses of city land that I've seen, um, which uh, originally, um, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Carolyn, but I think this was Wayne's original idea and then Carolyn has has picked it up is, um, it's, it's a little bit hard to imagine this, but, and maybe you've already talked about that. So I was uh, talked about it. So I'm sorry if I'm telling you stuff you already know, but right behind me. So there's a tiny parking lot behind city hall mm -hmm. and there's municipal building. And there's this space that like, you wouldn't really even recognize as space, but um, <laughs> our plan is to create SRO units right there um, on the city hall campus. So, um, you know, Ideas like that are, I think, pretty remarkable and, and I think show how hard the city is, is working to try and create possibilities where one might not even think there are. So any ideas like that that you have um, and support for projects like that um, are, are really important to me and, I, and would be a way that I would love to work with the housing partnership. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, I don't know if you have any... Uh, any thoughts to add on that? I mean, no, and I think we have a lot of units in the pipeline right now. Valley CDC is about to come forward um, at the uh, planning board hearing at the end of October for the Bridge Road project. And I'm sure you all are well familiar with that one. And that's a long time coming, um, not just to get that parcel back up into um, a useful place, but also um, for housing. Um, and then of course, Valley's other project on Laurel Street that was just permitted. So all of these will take time obviously, because then they have to go through and get the remaining funding um, aligned with, with those projects. So um, I think for this one year, I guess, um, um, you know, the permitting will, be fairly straightforward for those projects, but I think for this year, I, um, you know, I'd like to be able to think and have support from the community, including housing partnership, about other mechanisms that we can um, think about, not just to create affordable housing, um, because again, I think we're um, we've got a lot of those units in the pipeline, but we need that sort of that lower end of the market rate and um, so um, any strategies that we can sort of put forward and get support on or if you have ideas about that. Um, I think that's the other really tough nut to crack. Dev, I saw you had your hand up. Why don't you let the other two people who haven't spoken yet? Um, oh, okay, who else, yeah. who has had their hand up who hasn't spoken, Gordon? Hi. So um, I want to expand um, the conversation to other strategies, borrowing from Carolyn's word there, because um, we've, been, we've been talking about housing production, which is certainly fundamental to any sort of affordable housing plan. Um, but there are other things that we as a city should be, should be supporting and doing. And of course, one of them already is in the pipeline. I just want to put it back on the table is this, no, is this notion of um, uh, rental fees being um, Having the city uh, bar them from be from having a rental agents charge that fee to a tenant, um, you know it's almost virtually impossible if you're coming from outside this community, and you're moderate or low income to be able to break into this into this city to find housing you can either rent or for or purchase as a homeowner. So um, and that's relying again now we're relying on the on the private marketplace to be able to make it accessible to people. 
So the rental, I just want to make sure that, that the, the legislation that's pending to be able to do a home rule around the rental fees doesn't get lost and it gets the support of city government as we push that through. It's beyond our control to do anything about it at this point, but we wholly support it. Um, because you know what it it doesn't create up it doesn't create housing, but it creates more opportunity for people that currently are being basically shut out of our our, our rental marketplace. Um, the other challenge that we have is if you know you get a Section Eight voucher from our housing authority from any housing authority, it's almost impossible to use that voucher in Northampton. So, and that's an issue that tr transcends Northampton Housing Authority. It's, it's a regional issue, but really we, we have to figure out a strategy or, or other supports that would allow people to be able to afford even using that Section A voucher here in our, in our own community. I don't know what the answer is um, on that, but that's an important issue and it's, an, and it's a very critical barrier. And then, of course, the last thing is home ownership. And so it's, it's, it's you, know, you know, demand more, more units that are affordable for people who are buying a, who starter homes are, is important. But at the same time, there might be, the monies that we're talking about raising, increasing revenue isn't just going into production. It's going in, it could possibly use to help support people who need to purchase homes that might not have the capital saved up to do that or how, somehow be able to help in the financing package. So that would be another use of the money, new monies that we, we might be able to get through such as a, such as a real estate transfer fee. Um, just so quickly, um, Gordon, I, I completely agree with you. Um, so first uh, about the brokers or the rental fees. I So I'm just gonna brag a little bit, like my name was on that as a city councilor. And and so that's something that like, I, I believe really strongly in and worked really hard as, on the council side. And then um, is my name is now on it as the mayor. And um, I will do, I mean, I, as you say, it is sort of, it's out of, it's out of our hands though, you know, I, we provided a lot of strong testimony around it, um, but that is, that's a home rule that I will never let just disappear. I will follow it and fight for it till it passes or we all have to regroup and figure out the next steps. But um, I feel super, super strongly about that. And um, I think it's, it's um, a critical piece that can be the difference between someone getting housing or not. And so, um, I totally, totally am with you on that. Um, what was the second thing you said? I also agreed with it a lot. The challenges <laughs> with renting with Section 8 in Northampton. Oh my gosh, yes. With, with a new yes. voucher. Yeah. Yes. Anything, you know, whatever conversations we can have. We have some great experts in this room space right now on this. Um, yeah, no, it's it's um, it's incredibly hard. It, it's, we how how we make that match our rental market i don't know but anything uh, we can do to help i'm i'm happy to to have that conversation so i know there was one other thank you gordon thank you mayor Shara. i know there was one other person with their hand up or perhaps sarah. Sarah. i want to be aware of the time i'll go to you in a minute sarah i want to be aware of the time we allotted 40 minutes for this conversation i want to be respectful of people's time um so let's take another question or comment or two, and then it'll be time to wrap up the conversation. So Sarah, it is your, your stage. Um, thanks. I just, yeah, to go back to the um, real estate transfer fee, like it seems to me, uh, this isn't exactly a question, but, you know, it's surprising, like Carmen said, you know, if there's money that can be available, like, how it seems surprising like oh we don't really need <laughs> we don't really need more money that, that I feel like it is a pipeline issue and um so it sounds like we need to <laughs> more development and have money available I, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that as far as if the transfer fee was bringing in more money and we could in I mean that seems like the ideal situation like Carolyn was saying we, we need to obviously we're not meeting the goals for developing units so um, how can we do both of those things have have money and you know un unclog the pipeline as far as development um, and encouraging developers and um, also you know can we be creative with with the transfer fee um, money as far as 
use does it have to be used to develop or can we use it for um directly subsidizing you know like those people who are trying to get section eight vouchers you know i mean are there other creative ways to use that it just seems like if there's a funding source there's there's got to be ways to use it you know and um and there was one other thing but i'll, I'll just leave it there because i forget the other thing i was going to say well I, I mean i don't think that um i don't think we're saying not to figure out the details of the transfer fee i think it's where that money goes and i don't think creating a new structure or a dual structure of having an affordable housing trust and CPC makes sense. I think it would make more sense to have it funneled into one um, um, pool or um, um, under the jurisdiction of one committee instead of having two completely separate duplicative almost um, duplication of effort. So I don't, I think I just, I would keep the conversation sort of on two paths. One is if it makes sense and the language is right for the real estate transfer fee, that's one issue. And then the mechanics of how it works, I think is the other. Okay. Let me just say that some communities get all their housing CPC money up front and put it in their municipal housing trust and then have their other streams of income. So they all do come under one umbrella in other communities that are doing it. So yeah, so um, I guess to follow up with that, our, if we if it's all going to be in the CPA funding, um, are people open to increasing the percentage that we use for for housing um, from CPA funding? And I remembered the other thing I was going to say, which is uh, Carmen uh, mentioned at the beginning, you know, as talking about residential sales, but there's I know with the um, transfer fee idea that hasn't been, uh, some people think that it should also be um, commercial sales, not just residential. And, you know, there are ways to have exemptions for um, as far as with um, larger, if there's multiple units or multi-unit homes, you could have exemptions from the fee so that it wouldn't discourage multi. Sorry, that's a lot of different topics. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. We do need to wrap up the conversation. Is there somebody who hasn't spoken yet who would like to say something from the housing partnership or otherwise I'll give it back to you, Bev, for one, one additional comment. I, I think Hannah has her hand up. Hannah? Hannah and Gwen both have their hand up. Just sorry, I can't see everybody, I'm so sorry. So Hannah and then Gwen. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks, Carolyn and Merfiar, for being here. Um, I also just wanted to express uh, for the broker fee home world petition, which is something that I've cared a lot about. Um, I wanted to express how often people come to me, like knowing that I'm on the housing partnership and ask about it and ask about the status. And uh, what, what I feel like I can say to them is like, I think the status is good. I Like it's out of our hands. I think it's out of everybody's hands. I'm not sure. And um, that, that may be just what there is to say about it. But I kind of wanted to express just in this general way that I feel like right now it's, it's something that I know that I know there are so many people that are waiting on the answer for it because it's something that's like so deeply impactful for for people like when we're talking about like hundreds and or thousands of dollars that it could save people who are waiting for apartments in Northampton. Um, I'm not exactly sure what I want to, what I'm trying to express here. It's more just like, I know that it's something that people are waiting on. And in general, I feel like it's the process is still sort of opaque to me as somebody who's like, should be the person who has the answer. So um, I don't know what the answer is for like, how to better communicate the, the timeline to people. Um, but I, I guess I just want to just express in a general way that I know a lot of people care about it and I don't know what the steps are. I don't know what to tell people. And I'm like, is it months? Is it years? So um, it's sort of a, it's like, I'm like, I don't know. 
Um, so I guess I'm sort of asking, I guess the, my question would be like, what do you have a sense of actually what the next steps are and what the timeline is, even if the answer is like, it is out of our hands and out of your hands, but we should expect an update in a month or in a year. Cause I would just love to be able to tell people who have come to me in the past few months, like what, what to expect. Um, I share your frustration at how mysterious the whole thing is. Um, once it sort of, once we send it off to Beacon Hill, um, I actually, I have a call on another topic with both Representative Sabadosa and Senator Comerford tomorrow. So I will make a point of checking in and seeing if they have any That's updates. Awesome. Um, and Thank then you. I will, I will share it. Um, I feel like these things you sort of, you'll hear nothing and then suddenly there'll be like a flurry of activity and you have to like drop everything and make sure you're ready with whatever, um, you know, whatever you did pull people together. And, um, and I wish it was not quite like that, but um, if I can give us all any heads up, I certainly will, but I'll, I'll find out. Okay, thanks so much. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, again, we only have a couple minutes left, but Gwen. Right, so what I was thinking about the um, having the trust, um, I guess, um, you know, in terms of, and, and we may have already gotten the answer to this, um, but is, is there, you know, in terms of how the CBC divides up the money that they, um, you know, give to historical preservation, I mean, to say CBC, CBC um, you know, the, the, the trust would be strictly for that. So it would be only for that. And, and um, I, I don't remember if there was some kind of a difference in how um, the money can collect interest or something, but I just want to bring something up. Um, you know, I, I had considered doing, um, applying for the lottery through the um, Habitat for Humanity, and I had to pay $50 for a home buyer's workshop, which somebody later told me that I shouldn't have had to pay that. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of confusing to me. Um, how that worked, but suffice it to say that because of the minimum amount that you know I would have to make, I was never going to be eligible for Habitat for Humanity anyway. And I'm just only using myself as an example. This is nothing, you know. I don't need any personal response from this at all. But that's just my observation um, of you know considering these different options because I am in this position, you know. So thanks. Thank you, Gwen. I, I just thought maybe to wrap up and then I do have to, yeah. I have to go to legislative matters, but um, just to answer the question, I should say um, about the funding. So CPC has spent over $5 million on affordable housing, which is comparative, um, about the same that's been spent on all the other category areas. So, um, you know, that it's divided um, by historic preservation spending, um, affordable housing, um, recreation, and um, um, his, uh, historic preservation. So there are um, four categories, and it, the percentages spent um, housing and um, open space. Um, sorry, the other one. Open space are the two sort of highest um, dollar amounts that have been given about. 29% for open space acquisition, which have has also resulted in in um, um, uh, <laughs> land for affordable housing, and then about 25% spent on actual affordable housing units. So, um, you know, I think that that money is pretty equally distributed. Affordable housing certainly isn't at the bottom of the list for funding. Um, so I just wanted to, and and all of this, all of the um, CPC allocations are on the city's website. So if you need that at any time, you can pull it. Thank you, Mayor Shara. Would you like to say a few closing statements or one of <laughs> words? Well, I haven't prepared one, but I just, again, I want to thank you all for the work that you do. And um, I'm just, I'm really grateful. And, and I'm always happy to have conversations about how we can create 
more capacity, more funding, more more units, and you know any way that we can work on this together. I'm I'm very much in this with you and want to always always talk about it and and again value like any ideas that you bring forward. Um, so thank you so so much for devoting so much time for the city on this perhaps the most important topic that we uh, we try and tackle. So thank you. Thank you so much for both of you for joining us for this amount of time. Sure. All right. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. We'll continue Bye. our conversations. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <coughs> okay. I think we should continue this conversation now. The only other um, point of business we have is to approve the minutes, but I'd like to just go with this momentum here and see what people, where people's thoughts are now. Edgardo. Um, yeah, um, so I, first of all, I wanna appreciate Gwen for bringing uh, that last uh, um, point, for making that last point on on uh, on the fact that a housing trust would be specifically and only um, um, focused on on uh, housing issues and um, um, I'm kind of uh, I wish I had I said something uh, to that effect earlier as well because um, I believe uh, just as other municipalities do um, these funding should be going through the housing uh, through, through a housing trust fund. Um, and, and it could uh, work just as well, if not actually better, because there would be more people dedicated to um, uh, to focus on those uh, on those uh, particular issues and that type of funding. So I do appreciate Gwen bringing that up because that's I know something that we've discussed in this uh, committee in the past uh, about the difference between having a housing trust fund um, and having those funds going being funneled through that versus uh, the CPC. Thanks, Edgar. Ace? Jumping off of that and also off of things that I heard people bring up, it sounds like um, there is not a need for more funding to build new units and that that is aptly covered by, um, you know, the current funding system that exists. However, I'm not sure if a housing trust as set up legally can or cannot do this, but having it be able to provide funds, um, you know, as an example of help with a down payment or interest-free loans or assistance with renting or paying other fees regarding to renting or, you know, other aid money for housing that currently exists as a supplement does sound like something the city needs more of and that's not currently covered by the funding system that meets twice a year and would be beneficial for a housing trust as something that can react quickly and fund you know these discrete needs quickly and would you know be a reason to have a housing trust that isn't currently covered by existing structures, or at least not sufficiently covered by existing structures. Bev? Um, I, I had the same thought as someone, I think it was Richard. It's as a used to be developer, it's really hard to get my head around the notion that money is not one of the problems because yeah. developers spend all of their time raising money and there's never enough. Um, the operating assistance issue is very real. If you think about it this way, if uh, for an owner of a property, it costs, I don't know, $1,000 a month to operate the place, that has nothing to do with reducing the capital costs, right? That has to do with just what it costs to run the place. Um, and the operating subsidy problem is a really big one. I would love to see us spend some time on it. The problem is, when you support operating costs, you're making a long-term commitment, right? And so you have to have a funding vehicle that can unwaveringly support those costs for 30 years or whatever it is, if you're going to use it that way. Having said that, though, I, I came away from tonight feeling like 
until there's some agreement among the parties, and you guys tell me who the parties are, um, as to what the problems are, or what the barriers are to developing more units of a variety of types at a faster pace, the conversation about the trust fund is going to feel to others like, I don't know, just the best we could come up with, and we just want to compete with the CPC. And that's not satisfying for anybody. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering if we should either, you know, after talking about it further with either or both of, of our guests tonight, uh, think about doing our own little um, investigation. I don't. I, I can't imagine turning into a, a big needs assessment because then you get eight thousand people involved, and it takes two years just to do that. And that is partly the city's role. But but what if? And Carmen and I talked about this briefly. What if we interviewed, you know, five of the developers who are most active, or those who aren't? Mm -hmm. to figure out why not. What if we look at the relative um, problem of nimbyism? We were being polite tonight, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and there are strategies for dealing with that. Um, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, has Northampton explored inclusionary zoning, which basically says you developer, if you want to build 50 units, you know, 10 percent have to be affordable. That's it. That's it. We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> you figure out how to do it. Um, I mean, so <clears throat> say for the sake of argument, we spent two months, three months, whatever we think it is, um, having a series of conversations with people who are trying to get this done on the ground and came up with our sense of what the five key barriers are. I will be flabbergasted if money is not one of them, but I, I'm guessing the price of land or the scarcity of land or... Um, I'm gonna say this and this might generate a whole lot of discussion, but there is a small is beautiful theory that is alive and well in Northampton. I've observed it for many years and small is not scary. It's not scary to the neighbors, right? Uh, it's not overwhelming in terms of funding, um, right? If you're only handing out enough money to help make a three pro unit project work, you're not handing out all that much money. Um, it is scary when you start moving uh, to scale. That's when the NIMBY stuff really starts to crank in. That's when the dollars get big. That's when all the questions about can people of different economic groups really live together and blah, blah, blah. But I think until we get past that, that barrier, it's going to be, I was reading the CPC uh, data. And if you look at how much money they've spent and how many units they've created, it's not an awesome number. I think it's a total of what, 258 units in the last uh, two years. That sounds like a lot. And if you're one of the 258, it's great. <laughs> but if there's a thousand units that are short today and that number is growing by 300 a year, um, something's got to change if we're ever going to catch up. So um, the proposal, despite all the, the, the words, is uh, what if we offer ourselves as a way to kind of gather some current uh, reconnaissance on barriers to development of affordable housing. And we could certainly break it into categories, you know, affordable home ownership, affordable rental, maybe special needs, um, et cetera. Gwen? I guess some thoughts that I'm having is it is true, and I agree with Bev that, you know, when these big projects start coming in, it's the first thing that is going to get picked upon. Um, and then I'm just seeing that something that um, Jennifer wrote in that, you know, despite the smallness of many of these projects, there's still nimbyism happening. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I, I, I can't, I feel that I have to reduce it to what is really the issue. The issue is um, that, some people have a feeling that the quality of their life is being impinged upon. And so is it, is it a discriminatory issue? And so is that a root, is that a root problem? And the other thing is, I think that if, you know, sometimes I feel like, well, it's the design, you know, if, if it, if, if the design could be a, like more sustainable instead of 
you know, us calling it affordable. I think I think there's a stigma when when we say affordable, and I I really wish a lot of times we could get away from calling the housing that because no matter anybody's class, it's still a home. And so, you know, the idea is to meet the goals of sustainability by 2030. Um, you know, we don't have to have big units, but people would also need to accept that if there's smaller, fewer families going in infill, then there's going to be more sprawl. And, and so, you know, I don't know, that's just some thoughts I'm having, but I, I wish we could call it something else. I wish, I wish we could call it something else like sustainable housing, because a smaller unit that's temporary is ultimately more sustainable. Um, it's something where people live there and they move along and then it goes to the next person. So it is sustainable. So I think that's, that's just, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good thought in terms of kind of changing the language, but let me just point out, and I think Jennifer, you just put this in the chat. I don't wanna look at the chat because then I won't see who has their hands raised, but you put in the chat about the William Street home house and how that's being turned into eight kind of half condos and that is not affordable market rate. And there was incredible neighborhood pushback against that as, as well. So I think it's it's everywhere. There's kind of a staidness, you know, we're not gonna change. I wanna, I want to make a proposal, just see what people think. I want to go off of what you said, Bev, and I wonder if there's a subcommittee that would like to meet between now and the next time we meet and hear and develop uh, more of a, uh, more thoughts about how we can um, do our little, do our detective work and kind of that direction um, that we can outline to go in. And I wonder what people think about that. Um, I, before I say anything about that proposal, I just want to point out Richard and Keith both have had their hands up. I don't know if they want to add Thank to that you. or say something. Thank you, Rich, uh, Richard. Uh, Keith had his up way before mine if he wants to. Well, I can only see the top of Keith's head. So Keith, go ahead. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> um, no, I just want to address um, a few things. Uh, Gwen brought up um, money and I would say money is a problem, but not in the way you think. Um, uh, so Valley CDC or any developer really, they can only go to DHCD once a year and that's for all the projects. So right now, um, Valley CDC has 63, um, units in the pipeline between now and 2024, just in Northampton. And they also have 20 something units in, which is a new model for them in Amherst. So both in the pipeline for these two communities, uh, but they can only go to DHCD once a year to get this money. And DHCD is going to be a big kind of bulk of their of their project. So, for instance, Bridge Road, we're giving them one million dollars, um, and I think six hundred thousand of that is going to be CPC. But that is one million out of twenty-seven million. So it's just a really small percentage. But it's also very important because it's showing kind of that buy-in from the community. Um, so they have to kind of uh, manage um, their pipeline and stuff. In Valley CDC, they did, um, I believe they hired someone new to help kind of funnel the, it's like an increase in their development. Um, and then random things like um, Burt's Pit Road that um, Habitat came, for you, came uh, last month for. Um, that that needed to be, to be developed um, first. Um, they had to kind of switch gears because of a revision clause by the state. Um, so I just want to point that out. And I think parcels too, um, you know, there's, you know, one of the biggest undeveloped parcels in downtown would be a, kind of a great place to have housing is the old Leah uh, or no, the old Honda dealership. And it's a nice big parcel, but there's a lot of environmental concerns. Um, it's a dirty site and they're asking too much money for it. So, um, you know, this, uh, the thing behind City Hall, it's, it's, a, it's a very small, but we have to start kind of being more creative with 
how we're finding these things and how we're putting money together. So um, just want to put that out there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I would love, I love the idea of a subcommittee and I would, you know, I've done a little research on, on the trust fund, uh, but I'd love to hear, um, you know, development more of a structure if, if, if you're proposing that, um, because just not the money side, but the, how it operates within uh, the city and in the department. That's my, uh, my biggest concern, so. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Keith. Richard? Yeah. Um, um, sorry about that. I, I'm sorry, I'm a little discouraged by what I heard uh, tonight. I, I think the first thing we need to do is to talk to the developers and really ask them, you know, if there were readily accessible, less restrictive funding, what kinds of uses could it be put to for the various affordable housing needs? Because as, as multiple people have said, it's just sort of strange logic to think that money isn't somewhere the problem. The other thing that I think we ought to be cognizant of if we're trying to sell a transfer tax to the community, if we have our elected leaders on record that we have enough funds to deal with everything that comes our way, <laughs> number one, and number two, if we just give more, put more, another pot of affordable housing money somewhere, the CPC is just gonna fund less. Uh, those are two pretty big obstacles mm -hmm. uh, to you know, politically reach out to the community and say, we've got a need to do this and we're gonna impose this burden for a, a, a better cause. I, I, and the last thing I wanna say is, um, it seems pretty clear that uh, there is continuing resistance to staff the uh, affordable housing uh, trust fund. And uh, I've had a lot of experience on a lot of different fronts over 40 years trying to get the city to do something that the elected leaders are not behind. And um, mm -hmm. I don't think I have the stomach for uh, that kind of battle. It's, it's not a fun one. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask a question, Richard and Bev, when both of you have mentioned um, polling and talking to um, developers, right? And I'm, I'm sort of assuming when you say that, you mean, do you mean private developers, not places like the Valley CDC, or do you mean those? those I, think that the, I think it's two things. One is the obvious answer is both. But the first answer is the people that we know who've been doing this for a long time or people in other communities who run affordable housing trust funds. Um, and the other adjunct for it is, I think, you know, the housing market is changed so dramatically. I think that there are going to be opportunities and needs that we can't anticipate. And the notion that of having a funding uh, mechanism built in that is better able to be nimble and creative from what I could quickly gather, I don't think the trust fund has some of the same burdens that uh, the CPC has. So, and yes, private <coughs> if there's enough money, I think it's a big challenge. I don't want to be glib about it, mm -hmm. but if there's enough subsidy, you know, or, or an incentive, there are private developers and Northampton actually historically has had some private developers who have said, yes, we would like to do something affordable. That feels good to us. That's part of our, you know, <coughs> sleep well at night thing. Mm -hmm. And Pine's Ed was one of those. So I, I, I agree. I think we we talked to both. I would um, offer a friendly amendment to the, 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 the way the conversation starts. I would be more generic than starting talking about money. I would talk about barriers to development and money will come up, but it might come up in the oddest of places, right? It might have to do with pre-development. It might have to do with, um, if if you have to spend two years getting through NIMBY zoning process 
and you're covering all the costs, then pre-development can become pretty important, right? Um, and I, I, yeah, there's lots of good guy for profit developers out there. They only go places, however, where they think they can be successful. You know, I, 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 I shared this with, with you, I think, Carmen, but I, I live at Emerson Way, and I don't know who remembers this, but there were supposed to be eight affordable units in four <laughs> duplexes here yeah. of 50 units. Mm -hmm. There were two built, and the rest are being built down on Burt's Pit, favorite mm -hmm. place, apparently, to put affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, and I have no idea. I suppose I could spend some evenings looking back to see why the city let the developer off the hook, but that should never happen as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that's a little version of inclusionary zoning. Imagine if every developer who had to build any development of consequence just had to put in some affordable or what happens in many places, pay into a trust fund, X dollars per unit that they're not building. Um, that alone would have a significant impact, but it also would be pretty unpopular, I got to believe, among, among some parts of the populace. Um, yeah. But yes, I will volunteer if 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 such a committee happens to try and flesh this out, um, come up with something that might um, have more of a proposal format for the next meeting, say, does that make sense? Yeah, so it sounds like Keith, you, Bev, right? Keith, you want to be on such a committee? Uh, I'll uh be there. Uh, I just mentioned that it would be interest, I'd be interested in to hear about the development. And, yeah. I I'd really I'd really like to propose this committee. I don't know if we need a formal proposal, but I'd like people to be on it who who can. I mean, I don't. I would be on it and listen. I don't feel like I can contribute a lot to that. But who else would like to be on such a committee that would meet maybe for one substantial meeting between now and the next? housing partnership. Can I just question whether it needs to be a subcommittee or whether it can be people invited to future meetings of a series of months that we, because I, I I don't have time for a subcommittee, but I would certainly love to be listening in on the conversation about what are the challenges that are both our, the developers that are, we, that we are, that are the ones, you know, there's like, a, there's what, three or four developers that we know that do most of it, but also we need to think about who who in the private marketplace we could also bring into this and ask mm -hmm. them to visit with us. It doesn't all have to be one meeting either. Mm -hmm. um, I know just uh, just running out of time to do something like that. Out of this. I mean, and plus it's logistically, would there'd have to be public meetings, right, Keith? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Well, that's certainly another way to do it. I mean, who? Okay. We could line some. I mean, I don't. Do we have anyone scheduled over the next three three meetings? I mean, do we have other guests that we've been talking about. I don't remember. So we could. No, the could, only thing we have about. for next meeting is to talk about the um, various ways that the housing <laughs> ordinance, right, or whatever you call it, Richard, has been sort of scaled down over the years, right? We're going to put that on. November's um, agenda, but that is the only thing. We have no other guests. So who would we want to try to invite? Well, we'll name the, we'll name the first, the, the, the ones that we are, that have been many times to our meetings. We've got Valley, we've got Wayfinders, we've got the Community Builders has been before us. Who else is there? I'm missing somebody. Oh, <laughs> Habitat. And then you know there have been some private developers as well that years ago we've had a f we've had conversations with them but it's been a number of years since we've done that you know one, and something we did I don't know Richard you may remember this we did we did a whole workshop a public forum on development challenges and we invited a lot of developers to a meeting there was a public meeting and it was outside of this this meeting it was a separate event that we invited people to um, I remember it was at the the place where the art gallery is downtown on Main Street. You remember, Jen? you're nodding, Jennifer. You were there. I was there. Not much came out of it. I don't know anyone since Doug Cole, who you know died now decades ago, who was a, a private developer that has had any commitment to affordable housing, sadly. How about Beacon Communities? Were they part of the conversation? I don't think they've done any development in Northampton, but I know they're working in Amherst. Yeah.
But that's another model to do it. And it's despite what Jennifer said, another way to do it is to host something that they would be invited to an event that's maybe sometime in the next, you know, plan it for three months from now or something. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If we invited people to this meeting, would you invite several of these builders at once or would you do one at a time? Well, I'm just throwing out different ways. I mean, we could invite one at a time um, but if we held held a, an event, then we'd invite everybody to one event. Mm -hmm. Hannah, I think if you if if you if we have an event, there is at least the potential. I think it has to be a well managed event, but uh, for a more robust conversation, mm -hmm. you know, it can't be a cocktail party. <laughs> It has right. to be a conversation about um, what are the real issues and a, a genuine invitation uh, to get people to talk about the place that is Northampton for better or for worse and what yeah. their experiences are, right? Yeah, well, we'd invite maybe city officials too, the people that have something right. to do with this. It wouldn't just be us, it'd be maybe co-hosted. Yeah. Um, maybe even ask the mayor to host it. Yeah. Hannah, did, did you have your hand up? Oh, yeah, I was just um, sort of echoing what Beverly was saying that, um, uh, you know, one concern that I have about this idea is that with the idea of inviting private developers or builders that I would just want our goals to be really clear because I don't want it to be an opportunity for people to just um, talk a big game about all of their, you know, hopes for, you know, why <laughs> that they would love to build affordable mm -hmm. housing. But, you know, it's, I mean, I would, I would love to sit down with Rich Matowitz and ask why it didn't happen on Emerson Way. Um, but I feel like it can neither be a cocktail party nor uh, an inquisition. And so I would just want our, our like goals to be really clear for, for what it was that we wanted from, from a meeting like that or a series of meetings like that. Richard? I would suggest that we bring in one of our uh, most favored developers in first initially to have a conversation to get us more grounded in the territory as they mm -hmm. see it. Because almost all the time when developers come in, they're focused on one particular project and they're asking, you know, they're coming in and say, help us. And what we want to do is to say to them, we want you to come in and help us envision and plan and think about. So we want to pick your brain, you know, and, and I think that's a good starting place that might give us a better sense of where to go next. And I think certainly Valley might be the place to start, but I'm, I don't think it much matters any one of the, those more. Okay. Well, we're coming to the end of our meeting time. I mean, that to me sounds like a really good idea because I think we're not quite grounded in how we want to pursue and that and that they could help us as well as us get information from them. So um, we can extend an invitation to them. I mean, maybe, yeah, we can extend, I can extend an invitation to them and see if they can come in November. One person you might consider is Laura Baker, who used to serve on this board, knows it well, and certainly, if I understand her position now, is you know in in the thick of things with Valley, and mm -hmm. you know has served in other you know um, capacities around the area dealing with affordable housing. But you know, I don't care. I'm just mentioning that. Uh, Are people in agreement that we? can proceed like that, mm -hmm. invite more partners. I will, I will take the responsibility to do that, see if we can get somebody in November and we will proceed from there. I wanna make one comment and that is about tonight's conversation with the mayor and Carolyn Mish and that is that I was really surprised that they didn't have a better grasp of kind of the housing trust fund and how that might work and how um, community preservation funds might be put 
into it. Um, and I felt like in some ways the kind of the lack of create, creative thinking, I, I don't know, that's what just struck me, lack of creative thinking mimics in some ways sort of Northampton. You know, we're gonna keep things the same as they always have been. And your ideas are like, well, they're a little out there. So that was, that was my reaction. Anyway, all right, so we have general agreement, right? That I'm gonna try, I'm gonna invite somebody and get somebody from one of these and maybe Laura Baker would be a good place to start for our November meeting. Terrific. Okay. So we need to do one more thing and that is we have to approve last month's minutes. I did read them. I feel like the gist is there of what we talked about. I don't know if I can offer a motion Keith, can I as chair offer a motion to accept? I'll move that we accept. Second. Okay. Hannah? Accept. Jennifer? Yes. Edgar? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sarah? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Richard? Yes. Ace? Yes. Gwen and Bev, I think you need to abstain, yeah. right? Or Darren? Yeah. Okay. And I'll say yes. Minutes have been accepted. A plan has been established for next month. We shall proceed. Bev? I, I feel like um, it might make sense to talk about my newfound role on the CPC or at least for me to acknowledge it to folks. Mm. Um, I, um, it all started with a conversation with a friend who is on now and was stepping down um, and encouraging me, even though I had just accepted this appointment to look into uh, uh, being appointed. And so I, I started a couple of conversations and the next thing I knew I was appointed. And the next thing I knew I was down at city hall getting sworn in and the next thing I knew, I'm looking at this piece of paper that says I am a representative of the Northampton Housing Partnership. And I said, uh, no, I'm not. I don't think I am. Nobody ever suggested I am. In fact, if you read the CPC guidelines, <laughs> it's very clear about what organizations have the uh, authority to designate. Um, and this only happened within the last week. I. Uh, uh, shared all this with Carmen just because I wanted to figure out whether it was um, something she knew about or how that all plays out. But no. in any event, I, having read the CPC guide, guidance, I am now going to inquire about uh, whether this was a, an error. Um, but when I raised it with the clerk, who's not exactly the person to raise it with, right? You're standing there with your hand up. Uh, she said, well, there are several other vacancies going to come up. So um, if we need to swap you into a different seat or if anybody else who's on the housing partnership might want to be on the CPC, blah, 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 there's, there's going to be room. So I share all that because I didn't want anybody to hear about it through the grapevine. That's the story as I've experienced it to date. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I was thinking you were our representative for the, at the CBC now. Say, say yeah. what? I said I was thinking. Okay, so she's gonna. That's that's good. If we I, have somebody with the CBC. Well, yeah. If Step I am, up. if I am, but you know, it, it, again, I just want to make sure everybody knows what the heck it is. And if, if in fact, I mean, I'm sure the person who's the housing authority representative feels quite free to represent that organization. Um, and so Edgar, yeah. one of you uh, blessed me as your representative. I just need to sort it out. And if <laughs> they want to have a representative, they should go through a different process to get one, right? Yeah, <laughs> we didn't know anything we about this. We should decide who our representative would be, not uh, some weird process. Richard, uh, Richard has thank you. I don't Richard, think we've ahead. ever historically had a representative on the CPC. No. I'm mm -hmm. thrilled that you're there because I think your outlook is what matters, not your title. And yeah. I know that's, you know, the right thing. Um, so. Well, I, you know, I, I, I just 
have gotten through a week's worth of COVID. So I didn't make the first meeting that happened the day after my swearing in, but I got all the materials and I fell asleep this afternoon reading them. But I did stick out that there's no designated spot for uh, for NHP. So, Avent. All right. Uh, can, I, can I just add something, uh, Bev? Yep. Uh, so the mayor has been very diligent uh, going through the um, all the boards and commissions and making sure that we have representatives um, for the different things. So like disability commission, we have to have, you know, a city councilor, person with a disability. And so actually on the housing partnership, uh, there is a, a CPC member. Um, on oh, the there is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at our ordinance, I believe it says we have to have a CPC member. Um, and I think when you're... She asked me if we had any housing partnership people um, with these current app CPC applicants, and I identified you as being on the housing partnership. Um, so uh, I don't know. I guess it wasn't committed to you that that was happening, uh, but that was that was me. Okay. Well, thanks for that back background. I did, you know, have a brief conversation with the mayor of, of, about the whole topic, but not that never came up. The NHP connection. And Ava, I just didn't want anybody uncomfortable or surprised. Okay, we need to end hey. the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>